a Club Ready second album from a British producer, lauded for the genius of his debut nearly 10 years ago, a reinvention of an emo band 13 years into their career, a musical interpretation of a book about a nature reserve which was previously a nuclear testing site, a third album from a mercurial artist, and the next instalment from a much-loved UK indie band. This is 5 to 9's Album of the Month episode for September 2024. I'm Andrew Belt, editor of the 5 to 9 blog, and joining me as always is Kyle Blakesley of New Music Central, but sadly we are missing the presence of Mama Manana Records founder Kylie Larson, who has to take his car into the garage, and the garage didn't even bother to ask whether it clashed with this pod. <laughs> Outrageous. So, so we will gamely plough on uh, as a duo this evening. He is, um, uh, and... he, he is here in spirit. So we're well, rep- yes. representing uh, Mama and Yada Records with the t-shirt tonight. Um, so yeah, I hope, hope you're on the next one, Kylie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we, uh, we, we want you back. As soon as, um, and, and for the next episode, and, and yes, yeah, a nice touch that uh, having caught up with Kylie uh, only recently in America, Carla, you're wearing uh, yeah, a t-shirt to, to mark his, his record label and, and the festival, Locals Only, which was held a few months ago, which, uh, which Kylie uh, mentioned on one of our previous pods. So, um, so yeah, just the two of us for this one. Um, but before we dive into the five records, um, We'll we'll have a look back at September. So so Carl, I mean, what stood out for you outside of these five records last month? Yeah, so I, I mean, I picked out three three highlights, but sort of cheated on two of them as they are both uh, both new projects and live shows that kind of coincided with those uh, new projects. So um, the first one, which was definitely my live highlight of the month, was uh, Maximo Park who played an album launch show at Metronome here in Nottingham. Um, and it's one of those where I go to a lot of these album launch shows and they're mostly okay. Usually take place, you know, the following week of the release, 45 minutes of mostly new cuts with a couple of old favourites thrown in there as well. A lot of the time it could be like a stripped back set or two rather than like a full live band. Um, so it's a bit pop lock with them sometimes, but the Maximo one was, you know, in terms of album launch shows, it was top draw. Um, it was the it was the week in the run up to the album coming out, which was a nice uh, differentiator. Um, full live band as well, and they basically played the whole new album uh, front to back. And you know what? It was it was just brilliant. Um, I saw like the Wombats do something similar a few years ago. And it, I just kind of came out of that gig thinking, you know what, I think it, I just wish more artists would do it where, you know, rather than the following week of the release, they actually do it beforehand. I appreciate it probably doesn't help with driving chart sales and things like that. But um, no, it, it was just, you know, I love hearing new songs live and I love the live performance being the first kind of touch point for for the song, new songs you know I, I like the idea of like going back to the studio recordings with you kind of already have that greater appreciation rather than you know sometimes when you're listening to a record you might not be feeling it but you might go well it might sound good live so um where it, whereas it kind of like gives you that up front um and i think i listening to their new album this month i think i definitely appreciated it more um having heard how it came across live. So, yeah, just a great show from one of those bands that have been with me, you know, through my teenage years now into adult life, continuing to endure and, um, yeah, just continuing to deliver the goods both live and with their new album as well, really enjoying uh, Stream of Life. Um, So, yeah, definitely check that out if you've not already. Um, So that was the first one. The second one, it was another launch party, but this time it was for an EP um, from a local rock band called Board Marsh. Who, um, yeah, I mean we've got we've got lots of amazing bands coming out the Knots music scene right now. Um, I don't know what it is in the water here, but it seems to be um, having a real moment. With we've got quite a few bands coming through that are getting national exposure rather than just local exposure, and 
Lord Marsh are one of those that are quite quickly getting to that point, um, despite only being around for a couple of years. They formed in lockdown. Um, but yeah, this new, this new EP, it's just a great introduction. Four songs, 18 minutes, all like big anthems as well. Ideal for fans of, um, you know, bands like Editors, Interpol, The Cure, you know, anything dark, moody, guitar driven. If you're into that sort of thing, you'll definitely appreciate what they give you on this one. And yeah, again, got to go to the launch party the day of the release and it was just a great night. A lot of familiar faces there from the local scene. And uh, my dad came along too and he left, uh, not knowing anything about Board Marsh before the show, he left uh, suitably impressed. So that's probably the biggest thumbs up that I'll get is uh, pleasing my uh, hard to please dad. So <laughs> Yeah, so that, that that was my second highlight, Board Marsh's EP. And then the last one, um, I, this person did do a not, a not album launch show, but sadly I wasn't able available to go to that one. But it's been by far my favourite album from September, other than the ones that we're about to discuss. And that is uh, Someday Now by T.E.J. Pearson, who um, I know Kylie's a big fan of this record as well, so... This is probably a highlight from uh, both of us here as well. Uh, but yeah, just just an artist who keeps getting better. This is my favourite collection from her. Yeah, every single track is just knockout. Um, Save Me, Someday, Siren Song, all the tracks with an S at the start, basically, <laughs> are really good on this one. Um, the other ones as well, It's Mine Now, Long Range Driver. It's just a, a fantastic record, one that I've played a lot over the last month. Um, yeah, I mean, sadly it didn't win the poll, um, but I think if it had, it would have done quite well this month, um, in what is set to be a very, very strong context from my side. So yeah, very busy month, but yeah, those were my three highlights. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, Maximo Park, I, I don't know if they've not been around for a while. It feels like they're one of these who've come back, um, now that there seems to be quite a, I don't know, look back at that that indie landfill phase and you know i see you know the young young knives are coming back as well and 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 so there seems to be a, an appetite again for for some of the names which are maybe less familiar or less enduring yeah. um in the time since I saw matt mcglister you know friend of the podcast who i think he did uh, a review and it was quite a positive one of the new album so mm. So there's two of you there giving the thumbs up on the, on that one. Um, and yeah, Board Marsh, not heard of them. So one, one to keep an eye out for. Definitely. Um, and yeah, Katie J. Pierce and yeah, someone again who I hear a lot about but haven't really dived into. So yeah, that's that's becoming more deafening. <laughs> I think yeah. now, both from You'll critics and, and really? yourself and, and Kylie yeah. as well, you know, big fans. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm continuing my kind of, you know, non-music exploration outside of the five albums which we're we're listening to, and and kind of um, killed any live reviews with uh, deciding that end of the road was was an August festival rather than September in the last <laughs> pod. So, so no no gigs from September to report. Um, so instead, I just thought actually I'll use this just to talk about some of the bigger headlines really, which I think were all September if they're slightly out of uh, place then you know my bad apologies um but yeah t two reforming um stories oasis so uh yeah and i'm not saying that i'm I, I i'm not saying these are highlights so i suppose i'm quite neutral but um <laughs> that yeah i mean i think there is still something quite we'll, we we would never have heard the end of Please reform, please reform, please reform. So yeah. I'm very pleased that that they are for that made for that reason <laughs> by itself. Um, and I'm sure you know everyone who's got tickets will have have an amazing time. But um, that was a fairly seismic news announcement. Um, as was obviously the Lincoln Park one. Uh, mm. You know, returning with uh, this this uh, new singer who instantly became embroiled in uh, a fairly large controversy, um, which has also not been taken so well 
by uh, some of Chester Bennington's family. So, um, so very conflicted because you know, as you shared, Carl, the, uh, the performance they did uh, mm. online with this announcement it was pretty impressive. So uh, we both looked at that and said, "This is great." And I even looked at tickets for their show at the O2, which again was very quickly organised. Um, but but yeah, like. So there's me wanting to kind of, you know, don the old baggy chain jean trousers yeah, and the uh, <laughs> get the hoodie back on again. But but then also quite, uh, yeah, uneasy about uh, the way it's been done, really. And that it doesn't seem to have fully got the wish of the uh, of the Chester Bennington estate. So, um, yeah, they're just two big headlines, which I think were, were rather large in the music world. And, and there might be sort of, They'd have been done at different times of the year. They'd have probably been the two biggest announcements mm. all year. But the fact it always happened at the same time is um, quite something. And then the, the final one uh, was just as a commentary was the Mercury Music Prize. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah which, uh, yeah, we, you know, you, you, Kylie and I all watched in, in our various ways. Uh, you know, hopefully next year we see the return of the live performance and, and you know, bring back those iconic live performances, which they had. It, it did have a strange, you know, almost COVID-like feel to it in this small room. And um, yeah, yeah it's I suppose. Yeah, atmosphere, definitely. It's what I yeah, noticed bit, from this one. Bit of slightly awkward, but, but endearing nonetheless, I suppose, mm-hmm. in terms of like when the cameras did go on some of the artists, you could see how much it meant to them. You know, it still has that prestige. It's still an event, you know, we as music lovers always look forward to every year. Yeah. I unfortunately, didn't manage to get through all of them beforehand and have <laughs> have an opinion. I seem to be able to do that one every two years. So next year should be back to it. Um, but um, yeah, very pleased to see English teacher uh, win. And as I said to you guys, having seen them at End of the Road the weekend before, that felt like a kind of celebration performance that it gave me confidence that they yeah. would be a very strong uh, winner, even though plenty of the others were just as deserving. But um, but as as an overall kind of commentary, I would say this year it's back because because last year I wasn't massively enamoured with the with the list. You know, some great records on there, mm. but I feel like holistically this is um, yeah, a, a far more exciting list. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's definitely a stronger, like you say, a stronger list this year, but. In, ter- in terms of English teach, I think straight away as well, it was one where if you look at the genres that Mercury Prize, in terms of the nominees, they typically look for English teacher was kind of like the Venn diagram, like their sound is like the Venn diagram of all those, you know, a bit of post-punk, a bit of jazz influence coming through, a uh, bit of indie, and it was, it was kind of straight away, it was one of those records you listen to it and you're like, yeah, this one's got a good chance, so... Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm just glad I bet on them as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Um always good to get a bit of uh money based on your hunches as well. But yeah. um but yeah, I think it's been a few years since it's been an indie band, you know, and I'd say that like if you were to place them into any category, they'd probably be in, in that one. And yeah. you know, we, we were a little bit bemused by the kind of intro to them winning it, which seemed to suggest it was gonna yeah. be Nia Archives. <laughs> Which would have been another one I'd have been really, you know, pleased with. I'm, she's an artist I, I really uh, think is excellent. But um, but but yeah, I, I can't really think when the last indie album was. There's been, um, I suppose, Arlo Parks was was probably within that that kind yeah, of ballpark. Wolf, Wolf Palace before that in 2017. 20, 2017, yeah. yeah. But rap rap has probably been the the main genre these last mm. few years. So with obviously uh, the uh, the move to jazz last year. But anyway. Mm. Um, so that there were just a few few tales from September, which uh, which certainly you know drew my interest, and uh, and despite having less time to kind of delve into other music um, than these albums we'll discuss, mm. uh, yeah, some engaging things to uh, put my mind on uh, away from the workplace. So we'll go on to our first album now, and it's Foxing. This was Kylie's pick. Um, so, Carl, I think you already know of Foxing. It might be through Kylie before. Um, but, but yeah, where, where, where's your yeah, standing I mean, with them before this self-titled effort? Yeah, I mean, it, 
So yeah, it's a band that I've followed for a, a little while. So I was I was very happy that Kylie picked this one. Uh, big fan of Foxin's back catalogue. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an emo kid at heart, so they've always kind of been well within my wheelhouse, as it were. Um, but yeah, the la- the last record, Draw Down the Moon, which I didn't get the best critical acclaim, but for me, I absolutely loved it. It finished in my top 20 for the year. Well, within that, I think it was around teens um, for the year back in 2021. And the singles we got ahead of the ahead of the time for this project were both excellent. So it was kind of one where I went into it expecting good things. And, you know, we got that message from Kylie in the group chat after his first play saying that it was a masterpiece. And I think I think we were actually on a call at the time where both of us were like, surely it's not that good. Mm. But a bit of hyperbole going on here. But yeah, listened to it myself. And my word, what a colossus of an album this is. Um, I always find it interesting when, you know, bands have a self-titled this late into their career. It's almost like, they finally found that, you know, fully formed version of themselves after, you know, a few albums trying to find, you know, that optimum point in their in their sound. You know, we saw it a few years ago with just talking about the Mercury Prize with Michael Kimonuka. You know, had Kimonuka a few um a few albums into his career and that was kind of like his magnum opus as it was. And that's kind of how I feel about this boxing boxing album um it's kind of if you look back at the career um they kind of started quite you know gentle kind of emo to a certain degree um and you know it, they've kind of got to this point now um and i think after the experimentation on draw down the moon this feels like the natural evolution off the back of that record um easily the heaviest record that they've ever made really beefed up their sound and not just in terms of the screen vocals on here but also the music itself um has been really beefed up and yeah along with a couple of others on the list this month easily one of my favorite first plays all year and it's just gotten better with kind of each subsequent listen um i think i mentioned to you guys you know how 10 years ago um, really into both of them at a band called Death Heaven and it's almost like both bands have switched places Death Heaven have kind of really mellowed out whereas Foxin have just escalated their noise so to speak and yeah I, I, I just love it it's it, it's an album that's nearing the hour mark but it's one of those where it's eclectic enough that the time just flies when you're listening to it the first run in particular for me, is just packed with highlights. Secret history, fantastic opener. You've kind of got this low, lo-fi calm that then gets interspersed with these like jarring stabs of screams that kind of really wakes you up and locks you into the record. Like one of those where you're like, okay, we're going to be in for a ride with this one. Um, really strong opener. And then straight after that, you've got Hell 99, which was one of the amazing singles leading up to it. And again, it's just a full throttle, thrill ride. These like aggressive stomps and wearing synths. Um, again, it just knocks you, knocks you for six. Um, and then spit straight after that, you, you get this contrast of high pitched falsetto vocals. And then these like seismic earthquake like riffs coming through. Um, and then to complete that run, you've got Greyhound, which was the masterful lead single that we got right at the beginning of this cycle, as it were. And it's just this, yeah, dreamy, simp-soaked, eight-minute odyssey, and it's just scintillating. I think I think I always didn't appreciate it on first listen because it was on that um, weird music video that they had where they're doing the press conference, and it was kind of almost like a background to. <laughs> just watching them sat in the room um, and processing that. But yeah, hearing it on this record, it's just, well, just what a track, just really good. Um, So yeah, incredibly strong first half, and then it just keeps going on from there. Barking, 
is like one of the despite the name is one of the lightest and kind of like most instantly catchy moments on here gratitude probably my favorite track on the whole thing i think i said it to you guys probably one of my songs of the year at this late stage um in october connor i think i just think connor murphy's vocal performance you know it's outstanding throughout this album but on that song in particular his voice and then the barrage like the barrage even of instruments that they hit you with it's one of those where it's just really chaotic but in the best way possible um just a really cracking uh cracking song and then hall of frozen heads another great mini epic towards the end and then cry baby always brings it perfectly full circle to what we got at uh, in terms of secret history at the start in terms of the you know more lo-fi moments so yeah, while I while I'm not sure it's a masterpiece just yet, I'm always <laughs> quite cautious when it comes to uh dishing out those terms. I mean, certainly for me, it's one of my favorite records of the year, especially in terms of I think heavy records that we've had this year. I don't think anything off the top of my head comes close to this for me uh, um, at this point. Um, and now we're into the autumn months as well. It's it's we're now coming into the time where this album I think is really gonna find its groove. I don't expect to spend this more once the you know the weather gets a bit colder and I'm leaning more towards those emo records. Um, I think I'm just gonna spin this one more and love it even more as well. So yeah, excellent pick by Kylie and great way to kick off, kick off an extremely strong month for me. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, unlike you, didn't know of Foxing before this. And, and <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and I went in cold, like listening to the album, and then you go, whoa. <laughs> you know, you, you, you've said it about Secret History and Hell 99, you know, and the Screamo lyrics, and it's, um, yeah. Baptism of Fire, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, um, shows another layer to, to the music Kylie likes because because there's not usually sort of heavy picks from what what he has before so that was kind of a bit of a uh a, a gut punch um but in a good way mm. and uh was like okay you've got my attention now so uh, <laughs> but I think again you know you mentioned on on the chat with you guys about this um and you said just earlier you know yes it is an hour long that that I think is always a bold move for any artist to do. Mm. Um, but what it pulls off is is similar to to another album which I've very much enjoyed this year from um yeah, is it this plastic death glass beach. So glass beach. I, I can never get it fully <laughs> right, but but yeah, Gla- glass beach, um their their album Plastic Death, which, you know, just there's so much variety. There's there's quite a lot of um darkness and, and heaviness as well, but also some lovely light moments. And um and that's what this this album reminds me of because there's so much variety again here. You know, it begin begins as if, you know, they're a screamo outfit. Um the I think the the music still retains that kind of quite austere flavour. The lyrics are bleak as hell i mean <laughs> yeah they're very nihilistic um you know the, the ones on hell 99 are particularly funny I, I gotta say the ones about you know a depressing new year's eve watching mtv um <laughs> so so you know there's a lot going on here but then you know there are lighter moments as well it's not pure kind of uh desolation really and and, and then you know I, I find like as it sort of the further in you get the more interesting kind of genre cosplay sort of comes in i mean we've got uh you know looks like nothing which reminded me of say like a brand new or finched type track mm. um kentucky Mac- mcdonald's is just fantastic really <laughs> love that one um, you know just being at mcdonald's and being reminded of someone um you know i've got here a bit conseller-esque in lyrics so mm. i definitely see that that's where I see the crossover knowing, you know, how much you guys are, are into the um the music of the Consella um brothers or 
cousins, this brothers, cousins, yeah, cousins, cousins. cousins. Yeah. There we go. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the the threads here. Um, but then you know you get to dead internet, and and you've got this kind of basic electronica, which really reminds me of uh, Miu Zhu, um, the uh, Hong Kong British artist, and her mm-hmm. kind of electronic music. And um, yeah, you know you get these sharp turns and then and then it all comes to a head with cry baby which you mentioned in, in your review just there and and you know which is quite a clear piano uh led track um and and yeah almost like kind of going out into the into the world after being inside for a while it's got that kind of feel to it and, and a nice you know narrative arc um to it as well so yeah it, it really takes you on a journey uh, not for the faint-hearted either. I, I can understand, you know, someone who, who may not enjoy the the bleakness of it, but but I certainly did. Um, and yeah, just just yeah, one of uh, one of Kylie's best picks, I would say, this year by by far. Um, yeah. And and yeah, I think we'll likely to be pushing for for the the top honor this month. But yeah. <laughs> four to go. That's only the first one. So uh, so now we move on. To our second album. And this is Ness by Hayden Thorpe. So um, maybe not a surprise for, for those of you who follow the channel on YouTube, <laughs> but uh, this was Carl's pick. Uh, Carl, of course, has completed the the interview with Hayden, which is very much worth listening to. Uh, it includes some of the tracks from the album as well. And you can get a, a real deep dive on this album, the inspiration for it, um you know even talk of wild beast the time he had there the different dynamic mm. as a solo artist um and the cheeky question about whether the the band will reform at any stage particularly as that seems to be an ongoing trend at the moment so do uh little plug there but but yeah. do give that either a listen on spotify or, or watch on youtube it really is um yeah a, an hour well worth your time um but anyway with that i'll hand over to carl for uh for what he actually made of the the album, I mean, I've read your review in, in Clash and that's another, there's another plug there, read that. <laughs> so, um, uh, and that gives me um, the view that uh, it's a very positive uh, association you have with this album. It is, yeah. I mean, I was going to, I was going to start with a plug and a thank you, but you've kind of already, you've already <laughs> kind of already done that. So, uh, yeah, yeah. like Andrew said, if you haven't already checked it out, we'll stick a link in the description as well, where you can dive into the world of Ness a bit more. Um, but yeah, also just want to quickly, you know, thank Aiden for the time, taking the time to do that interview as well. And yeah, everyone who's watched it so far as well, just really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. So yeah, on, on to Ness itself and yeah, without going into too much background as it is all on that interview, it's, it's one of those where it's important to give some context to this project, I think, because it does need that to truly appreciate it, I would say. Um, so yeah, this is actually a, an adaptation of Robert McFarlane's book of the same name, which explores the site of Orford Ness, which is this coastal nature reserve down in Suffolk. The, as you kind of mentioned at the top uh, of the pod, it was also a military testing site during both World Wars and the Cold War. So the uh, Atomic Weapons Research Establishment, they had a base there and they conducted all the uh, environmental testing of the nuclear arsenal at that point. Um, however, it was then the Ministry of De- Ministry of Defence sold it to the National Trust in 1993, who then left it to rewild, and it's now this place where you know nature lives and breathes uh, once again. So, you know, it's, it's a very interesting place. It, you know, not a place that I knew anything about before. You know, being introduced to this project. But you can see the attraction, what would draw someone to it. It's, you know, this place, you have this collision of, you know, man-made destruction and at the same time, natural life. Um, and that is what Robert McFarlane in his book paints and in turn Hayden has, you know, beautifully brought to life, I think, on this album. Having now read the book too, um, I'm was recently in the US and I read it on the plane and then I read it with while listening to the album while I was on the plane. 
And it it was, you know, seeing the alchemy with which Hayden has picked apart this book and redacted the source material in order to turn it into this collection of songs and this piece of music is just quite incredible. And, you know, I said, I said it in my class review, the biggest takeaway for, for this project for me is the end result is nothing like anything else I've heard all year. And I will, I mean, I'll start with the caveat that, you know, this is an album you have to, I think you have to commit to, you have to invest the time in it. And like I said, I think that context to the project being a book adaptation, to knowing the place that it's about, I think that context is important to how you appreciate the music and how it plays out. But I think with anything that needs you know, that amount of investment, the rewards you get at the end are just resplendent. I mean, for me, it you know, again, it, it's just not, it's not like just another album. It, it reminds me more of what public service broadcasting have been doing so well, which is taking this source from another medium and transforming it into something completely new. You know, there's also shades of, you know, Nick Cave on here with the, you know, some of the orchestral compositions that he's put together in recent years and the the prose-like lyrics that he has in his music. Um but yeah, it's 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 ultimately although it's got similarities to those, it's ultimately so unique for me. And it's at the core of it, it's just Hayden playing this conductor role and doing it so masterfully, you know, the propeller ensemble on this album with the wonderful woodwind arrangements. You've got uh, Kerry Andrews, who does the god gorgeous like choral work as well. Um, and I've said it before, my favorite records are the ones where, you know, it offers something unique. It's an eclectic listen, but it also has that single narrative that brings that eclecticism all together into a you know, a singular project. And I think this ticks every box for me. Um, I won't go through the whole thing, but in terms of highlights, I'll just pick out a couple because re really for me, th this is all about experience the whole, it's one of those where it's like, I'm going to experience the whole thing rather than go into the individual pieces if I'm putting it on. Um, but, you know, picking out just a couple, Merman, brilliant opener, that heartbeat like bass, that just feels like the sound of Ness coming alive to start the record. And I think I saw Hayden, I read a Clash interview with him today where he referred to it as a, a Jaws requie Requiem, uh, which I think hits the, nails off, hits the nail on the head. It's definitely got that Jaws soundtrack feel to it. Very, um, you know, you've got um, the contrast of the dark, like ominous electric sound with his pitch perfect vocals and then the floaty clarinet that comes in. It's just an outstanding, outstanding mood setter for the whole thing. Um, he, one of the singles for the project and the closing track to Side A, if you're listening on vinyl. I'm just addicted to that song at this point, that chorus melody melody every time just weaves itself into my head. It's got like the Rolling Stones swagger about it with the oh was it the jag and haggle of the gulls yeah <laughs> it's jag and haggle of the gulls yeah, yeah it's just such a great line and um yeah some old it's got some old worldy instruments on there too there's a, a sack book which is like this old trombone and a spinet which is like this um older version of, of, of piano um and i think that gives it a really unique again a unique sound and a unique feel uh, to that song then in the back end my absolute favorite track v or five uh which is the what i should say as well is each of these songs kind of represents a chapter in robert's book he's kind of taken those and basically translated them to a song but v or five is like the fifth and final chapter of the green chapel narrative that runs through the uh, runs through the album and you know, with that being the last chapter in the book, it's kind of like on here, it's the grand climax of that, you know, song of the bomb narrative that runs through the record. And 
yeah, it's it's my favourite moment on here. One of my favourite songs that he's done. Well worth watching the animated video that goes with it. But the song itself, you know, it's got those siren-like electronics. It's a mix of spoken word and these, you know, goosebump-inducing choral harmonies. Um, again, it's dark, it's ominous, but yeah, j just a sensational song. Uh, I really love that one. And, yeah, I won't go into the others. I, I love the whole thing, as you can probably tell. But, um, yeah, I could happily talk about the ins and outs of this record for hours, and we don't have that time. So <laughs> I'll just end by saying this album right here is the reason why um, Hayden Thorpe is, you know, my favourite artist, because it's, it's something completely out of left field, like, compared to his last two records as a solo artist, particularly compared to his last record as Wild Beast. You know, if you listen to this, you wouldn't even probably know that it's the same artist that's put them together just because they're, it's so completely out of left field. It's so different to what he's done before. And yeah, like I said, it's completely different sonically to the two solo records that came before it. And he's, he's just an artist who's never playing it safe. His musical ambition truly has no bounds. And yeah, for me, this is a record that it just delivers a must-hear experience like no other. It's how I'd wrap it up. Nice way to wrap it up as well. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for, uh, I'm very much a fan of of Wild Beasts. I was lucky enough to see them on their, their last show at the, the Hammersmith Apollo. I think you said in the chat that you were there yeah, as well. Yeah. So that's... Funny, um, <laughs> we were there for that one, but um, yeah, I, I, you know, obviously seeing him, I was aware that he did Diviner at the time. I, I think I didn't sort of dive more deeply. Um, I kind of compare it a little bit to like the Maccabees and Orlando Weeks, and 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 that I've just at the end of both bands, I've kind of left it there, and mm. I'm not really sort of uh, explored what they're doing. By themselves and this, this is a, a perfect il illustration of why i should be because <laughs> uh, because yeah i mean i don't need to add too much i think you know everything you said you know you've got a, a 360 degree knowledge now by now if you've read the book as well uh, i haven't read the book but certainly feel you know over the last however many weeks very immersed yeah with this with this album and, and very much enjoyed reading about it uh, including your review, including the the, the clash interview today, and, and obviously listening to the podcast you did with Hayden. So um, yes, uh, I think one of the things I enjoyed so much about Wild Beasts um, were their lyrics and just how offbeat and how eloquent they are as well. Um, and clearly, he's found a kindred spirit um, in Robert McFarlane with you know. The one lyric I picked up here is the one you actually mentioned, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, Endeavour the Jag and Haggle of the Gulls. It just sort of is a real earworm and it just stays with you. And there, there's there's similar, you know, interesting lyrics quite often about about birds. And um, I'd probably mm. understand more through through reading it. But um, but I'm kind of happy enough with the album, really. Um, so, I mean, in terms of my highlights, Merman was one of mine as well. Uh, it... Mm. Which is just fine, instantly engaging. Uh, Very wild beast that one as well, yeah. Yeah, That's the all, most wild all about beast drift yeah. um, in there, which I'm sure there's an extra meaning on the drift side of things. <laughs> um, probably a few different ways you could take that, and and just you know saying that it's engrossing and intimate. Probably my favourite uh, is she, um, which I actually song, think could yeah. could just be a standalone single, um, mm. and it's just and real timeless you know acoustic track which to me is jeff buckley jeff buckley-esque mm. it's nick drake-esque um you have some backing singers which just like it's just sumptuous <laughs> it's just so, one of those songs you know like yeah. some of the best like chilled songs you know like otis redding sitting on the dock of the bay that that sort of vibe that's what i get through she and where i could just sort of luxuriate in it and just sit back and just be completely <laughs> yeah. um in bliss in 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 those moments 
Um, and then they, you know, uh, that was uh another one you mentioned uh which has got some kind of electronic bongo percussion acoustic guitar overlay um so yeah they're they they're probably my standout tracks um i think a couple of them like as standalone tracks probably aren't as mm. engaging i mean you got the uh interestingly titled wtf is that <laughs> uh, up which it kind of con- it, it maintains that ominous nature of 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 um, what's begun with Merman, um, but yeah, I, I don't think you'd you'd go to that by itself particularly. No. Um, There's a few like interludes as well that kind of just tie yeah. its narrative together more than anything, I'd say. And and as and as you yeah. said before, you know, this is one to really take as a whole and just mm-hmm. immerse yourself. Um, so, so yeah, there are a few which which are of that ilk, I would say. But the overall experience is is just such a such an engaging listen, such a different album, um, and it yeah just just has that rare ability um, of an album where it just sucks me in like purely and completely, um, and and no doubt will be high up, um, yeah, come the end of the year as as well. So. Um, Yes, very pleased to be reintroduced to uh, to Hayden Thorpe in his in his solo artistry. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you like, we, uh, if you like, she and you know, closer away, those kind of tracks definitely go back to Divider as well. It's it's mm. just him, his voice, and a piano, basically the whole thing, and it's it's incredible. Yeah, worth checking out. Well, yeah, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, definitely would be a worthwhile endeavour. Um, and yeah, you know, we were thanking Kylie for Foxing and, and now, you know, I'm thanking you for, 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 for this <laughs> album because, because yeah, two, two really, really strong. And I think continue, you know, we, we talked about August being an excellent month. I think here as well, some of these are way up there. So uh, yeah, we're, we're hitting our stride in 2024 just as we're uh, starting to look back <laughs> yeah. as well. Um, but let's see if we can continue that momentum um, with our third album. It is In Waves by Jamie XX. And Carl, again, I mean, this was your pick, but for the poll, mm-hmm. uh, which then won out. So, uh, yeah, how how did you uh, get on with In Waves? Yeah, so originally wasn't my pick for the poll. Uh, if you remember, originally had Dolores Forever's yes. de- debut, which is also worth well check well worth checking out by the way um but yeah we were all i think it was one where we were all talking about how big we were on the singles mm. um leading into this one and i think you and Cardi both eventually twisted my arm and i went for this one instead and yeah lo and behold it's done to victory and i'm so glad it it did as in a year of truly brilliant electronic records this one is right at the very top for me um i i loved his first solo album in color finished in my top five with the year back in 2015 but for me this is a big step up even from that record um the way these songs you know what of a better word or they're all bangers in isolation <laughs> but then they're woven together here into this glorious, like hit filled DJ mix. And it's just it's just one of those where it's a joyous listen from wall to wall. And it's just the perfect kind of end of summer, you know, dance and electronic record. I think the sa- the samples used are exquisite. The collaborations on here exceptional as well. And for me, it's one of those records I just I can't fault it. It's as close it's as close to a 10 out of 10 for me as you can get. I think in terms of I think in terms of favorites, I'm I'm sticking with those singles. Um Treat Each Other Right, just an absolute beast of a track. Love the beat, love the sample. And I think um, you know, coming right at the start of the record, it just properly kicks everything in, in into gear. We then get the, you know, an XX track, as it were, with uh, Romy and Oliver jumping, jumping in on Waited All Night. Again, a killer beat and 
the production which you'd expect from a JVXX records uh, on that track and all the way through is just outstanding. Um, and then, yeah, the other the other single, which much like the last of the party, you know, put in nothing matters as like the big penultimate climax to create this triumphant moment. Jamie's done something similar. Obviously, there's a there's like an interlude that's a bit of an outro, and then the final song is more of like a an outro as well. But yeah, all you children with the avalanches is that. It's that big triumphant moment on this record for me. It was already my so- my song of the summer. And I think, yeah, j- again, like Rob Blast in a party did, I think where they've placed, where he's placed it on this one, you know, with, yeah, was it Breva just before it? And then the outro that kind of comes after it, it just hits even harder in the track list in here. Um, in terms of other... Songs like Sun Sleeper by Barry Can't Swim, which obviously we reviewed last year. I can hear a bit of that coming in. I can also hear a bit of like the Chemical Brothers coming in there. You know, it's it's just an incredible track. Obviously, if you're sounding like Barry Can't Swim and Chemical Brothers, it's two big plus points for me. So, um, and then there's a few tracks on here as well where, you know, where it is just Jamie Breaver I just mentioned, but you've got ones like Still Summer and The Feeling I Get From You, um, which again, you know, it, do, it shows that he doesn't need the collaborations, although the collaborations are great. I've, I'd, I'd say the ones where it is just him uh, doing what he does best, which is making these incredible um, beats and electronic tracks. Again, that's some of my favourite moments on this record. So not too much to say other than, you know, this is another exceptional record from JB, who I think between his solo output and the records with the XX, for me, he's now five for five, just incapable of making a bad record. And honestly, this this one is probably already my second favourite after the XX debut in that catalogue of five just an utterly intoxicating blast from start to finish um and it's one of those that i've recommended to quite a few people this month in terms of people that i know are into their electronic music and stuff like that um i went to a manchester united game and put this on it we were driving back late at night and i was they were like oh what music should we have on and i was like put the jamie xx album on and instantly it was one of those where instantly everyone's like what is this? I don't know this guy, but this is so good. So, um, yeah, just great album. Love it. And, uh, yeah, great to have another Jamie XX album because it's been almost 10 years since In Colour. And, yeah, like I said, this one uh, supersedes that one for me. Yeah, so, um, obviously, me and electronic music is not always... Uh... <laughs> the, 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 the fit I'm, I'm usually the outlier with you and kylie i suspect with this one probably a bit as is as well but i did enjoy this album very much um and also like based on the singles as you say we encourage you because you kind of <laughs> think um you and kylie have become sensitive to um to the fact that most electronic albums are, are maybe further down the list on a monthly basis so you know there's very much a desire that i want to really <laughs> get, get into them but it seems the the electronic albums I sort of like the most tend to be the more uh, I don't know laid back kind of border Canada style things or um, or DJ Shadow, which are always my two two preferences. So uh, you know, very much enjoy, enjoyed uh, Taicho from uh, the other month, mm. which was Kylie's one, and, and that one was probably sort of leading the way uh, so far this year. Um, so so yeah, like. I think it's one which I enjoy more than I do by analysing it, if, if, right, if that yeah, makes yeah. sense at all. So, and and I I had a struggle between this and another one about which should go above the other. Um, if I just look at the scores I've given, this would go below the other one, and uh, and quite clearly. But but it still doesn't sit quite right that this isn't above the other one. <laughs> 
Um, so, so there's an enigma for you uh, that I'm kind of uh, fighting myself in this way. Um, and as a listen, yeah, it just kind of flies through. Um, I suppose the elements which I maybe struggle with a little bit is is the more like where I'm listening and I'm going, okay, I'm transported to a club right now, mm. which to me is not like a. Uh, it's more a feeling of alienation when we're that, with that kind of and being in a club and having like being with a group of people and just being like, oh, I suppose I have to put up with this kind of thing. But um, which is more a symptom of the wider uh, club music uh, feel because this is much better than that uh, for sure. But but that that's maybe one way of kind of contextualizing uh, why it doesn't sort of land as much as uh, I feel it should. Um, but yeah, there are still some awesome tracks. I mean, I, I really like Baddy on the Floor. I think that, that, that one is up, yeah. just <laughs> quite an iconic feel to it. Um, yeah. And yeah, just, you know, very catchy piano. Just, you know, you could have that come on and, and instantly just have that that feeling, which is very positive around it. Uh, Daffodil featuring Panda Bear, Kelsey Lou, John Glacier, you know, uh, about being sucked into a loving moment. I tell you, you know, something I do enjoy whilst, whilst obviously, and like a lot of dance records, the the lyrics are minimal. But what I do like about this, and I suppose it reminds me in that way of um, of a, of our, our friend from from Hot Chip, Joe Goddard, um, is is the kind of joy uh, being conveyed on these records, and and that is, you know, particularly in in, in a month where you know we have foxing. <laughs> this is this is quite yeah. a nice antidote. Um, you know, love the Foxing record, uh, but it's also good, you know, and I think think back to even, you know, Ibibio Sound Machine, I think it, there, there's a place for that more uplifting music and this very this sits very well into it. I think the lyrics really are, um, you know, very positive, very about the feeling of either being in love or, or just in, enjoying a moment. Um, and that really comes across throughout. Um so, so yeah, I mean, falling together featuring Una Doherty. That's that's the final track. Another one I really enjoyed. Um, you have a it's quite dreamy. You have a big beat towards the end, uh, and it's quite chilled in terms of the club beat as well. A bit for those I love as well, with like the spoken word kind of mm. style that's on there as well. I thought, yeah, yeah. yeah so, yeah, I think. I'm looking at my score and going, okay. And I actually listened to it the following night after I did my score <laughs> because I was like, how have I got to this point? But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's still not not landing from a wider perspective with with this genre. And, and um, but yeah, there is something quite uh, yeah. I'll use a phrase from from quite a long time ago, snackable about this album, where it's just <laughs> quite like it's an easy kind of stick on, and yeah. it's not dull in any sense at all it's got that life it sort of um yeah invigorates you and uh and, and yeah as far as kind of the genre goes this is this is very much at the the top of uh what can be produced with an electronic record so so really enjoyed it um and uh yeah but not as much as as you for sure uh carl or, or, or even kylie i'm sure mm. um and and yeah, confused by my rating system. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll end on that uh, mystifying note. Um, so we go on to our fourth album, which is My Method Actor by Nilifer Yanya. So yeah, by now, you and Kylie will know that this was pretty much my highest anticipated album of the entire year um, we had we had everything everything earlier in the year which also was a similar level of anticipation and and they were the two which were top um of my list from 2022 so you know nicely consistent that two years later they come back um and and yeah I, the you know painless which was her her second album is just such a strong album it traverses many genres um you know i i feel that the the first album was was a great first effort um you know there was a concept with that one as well um about uh being at some sort of 
health club and and all this kind of I suppose corporate lyrics in a way, which is there's there's there, there was quite a lot going on in terms of that that idea, um, but maybe didn't have the cohesion which which then Painless provided, and then I, they felt like okay, Nilifa Yanya's really hit her stride because I'd I'd already been aware via End of the Road Festival of her as an artist and her EPs. I absolutely love uh, some of those earlier EPs as well. So someone I've, I've really, you know, followed her her journey um, from from the early days uh even interviewed her um at, at gig wise as well at, around the release time of, of of painless and um going to see her later this year so um yeah one of my favorite kind of current artists um and the singles did not sort of dampen that enthusiasm uh by any stretch you know we had uh like i say run away that which is now feels like a song I've known for a, a long, long time. A few months ago, that first came out. And um, and yeah, that that to me was Nilifer at her best. Um, you know, got this kind of like intriguing oriental string lick at the beginning, you know, the fuzzy guitar in the chorus, um, usual kind of like intimate yet opaque lyrics, which I think is what her kind of USP in a way. Um, and about worries about losing a lover, you know, there's just, yeah, I just thought one of my favorite tracks, even perhaps this year, uh, then was followed up with Method Actor, yeah, it almost the title tracks, uh, losing my from, from it. Um, and another one where you got that, this just crunchy guitar coming in, in the chorus and, um, yeah, really sort of, uh, leaning in to the more kind of Brit pop aspect of, of what she can do and, 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 you know, great guitar work. Um, and then we had sort of mutations, which was her the third single. Wasn't quite as into that, but that one's grown on me over time. Um, and then the last couple of singles as well, um, you know, and this is subsequently after listening to the album, like, you know, showcase what, the bulk of it is um and i think pretty much every song if you listen to by itself is is very strong um few let few slightly below um the kind of main strong consistency here um but but my main criticism is is that i feel like i'm listening to one album after the first three tracks, which just blew me away. Cause I'll add, we've had, like I say, I run away and method actor. It, it begins with keep on dancing, which is just two minutes kind of really engaging short blast. You know, about someone making her miserable lo-fi indie, you know, and then it's followed by these two singles, which I've heard and loved. Mm. And, and I'm in the zone <laughs> at this point. <laughs> We then have binding uh, and you go kind of going, okay, so we we've taken away that kind of real um hit in, in and, and crunch in the music. And you know it, it never really returns that 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 kind of crunch and the the kind of um more kind of heavy nature of some of her music. Uh it just stays in that one lane after that point. And and like I say, you know, overall. I still think this is a great album. Um, mm. And and I say uh, individually, I think near enough all of the songs here are excellent and really worth a listen. But I just find it disappointing from a mixing perspective that you begin with sort of three in one vein and then it becomes yeah. almost an entirely different album, where, which sadly, because it's that one speed, you know, it almost gets a bit dull in that sort of middle sort of part of the second section from track four onwards um and that's disappointing and 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 uh, yeah i just just wonder if there could have been a bit more of an avenue to have included maybe a couple more like the first three tracks to really balance this out and then also mix them up which would have been perhaps a bit more mm. like painless i mean she shouldn't be doing painless again because that's <laughs> that's not what artists should do of course but um but yeah i really had for, for an album i ultimately think is is like say very strong i had quite mixed feelings um also not helped by the very 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 high expectations i had for this uh, which is always can be a bit of a killer um when it comes to it so um like i say mi mixed mixed overall impression but 
but very strong album. Um, and and the disappointment lies with more the uh, the producer <laughs> of the <laughs> album, and 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 a little bit with Nilfer as well. That there, there couldn't have been um, just a couple more songs which which sort of move away from this quite slow, introspective, relationship oriented uh, songs which make up you know seventy five percent of it. Um, so so yeah, there's my kind of torn review. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as 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 a big fan of hers and uh and and yeah obviously i mean you were the first one of us to listen because you also went to um was it an album show she did album show yeah yeah and and i know you were, and, and and i suppose that's what i'm interested in, is when i see her live whether that will give me a new appreciation of 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 the album and the songs as well so yeah yeah i mean what do you think yeah i mean uh, i mean so like you i mean as you know massive fan of painless didn't finish quite as high as it did for you but you know 14 for my best albums of 2022 so it was still right up there um in terms of my albums of that year and yeah same as you high expectations going into this one particularly as the reviews as well in the build-up have been positive and as you say managed to catch her playing a few of the new songs at her album launch show here in knots um and yeah, I think I've come away very similar to you in that I'm thinking this is still a great record, but maybe it's own, it's Nilifer's own very high standard that she set with that makes it a slight disappointment because after quite a few plays now, I ultimately don't don't love it quite as much as Painless. Um, you know, it could, it could be the fact that. <laughs> You know, it has come out in such a stacked month for music, as, as we've seen from the first uh, three that we've reviewed here. But um, for, for whatever reason, it's just not resonating with me quite as much as the those other albums at this point in time. But I think that, yeah, I mean, the biggest difference for me is it does feel, um, it does feel, sorry, less varied and less eclectic than its predecessor. It's... Like you said, it's a record that at times it does feel quite singular paced. And, you know, like you say, I mean, there's some really great stuff going on here. Keep on dancing. Like I say, run away, as you mentioned, really strong opening combo. Got those awesome, like smoky acoustic guitars going on. Just absolutely love it. I know you said you were kind of turned off by the middle section, but that's, that's actually where my favorite st- <laughs> my favorite stuff comes in. Mutations is by far my favorite cut on here. Just everything that makes Nilifer's music such a joy. You've got those sh- shuffling drums, those bluesy riffs, you know, soft tender vocals, gorgeous strings coming in towards the back end of that song too. It's just that one's just absolute bliss for me. Ready, ready for sun straight after similar story. Um, another you know, beautiful string drenched number. Um, and then we get some nice guitar work on Call It Love after that one as well, um, which I think is superb as well. So I'd, that, I'd actually say as much as I love the first three tracks, you know, it's that run of three in the middle is probably the best part of the whole album for me. Um, there's other tracks like Just a Western that I just want to shout out that is also very good, but maybe also it ends up covering a lot of the same ground as the songs around them. You know, I mentioned that we mutations are ready for sun, like you said. They just kind of, yeah, like you said, stay in that lane and don't kind of deviate from it too much. Um, so you get a lot of songs kind of around the same period on the album covering covering the same ground as it was, which on Painless was never the case, you know, from song to song. It was just, you know, she takes you here, she takes you there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I hope I hope it doesn't sound like I'm being too negative because I still love Nilifer's music. I still think there's some really beautiful moments on here. But yeah, probably say, came away the same way as you, that it's one that overall maybe ultimately just falls shy of hitting the lofty heights of its predecessor. And because of that, you can't help but feel slightly disappointed. But yeah. like you said, still a great album. Just 
Yeah. She's made it. She's made it hard for herself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Setting such high expectations. It's only because we we yeah love her music. So uh, yeah. So yeah, and, and but there is so, so much to take from it, and uh, I think mine was a bit more negative actually. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think overall, if 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 this was a debut record, I think we'd we'll, we'd have a very different tone about it and just say mm. what an amazing record it was. So um, yeah, there we go. Y- you learn. Don't don't get reach such heights because then you can never disappoint people, <laughs> <laughs> which is almost like the dodgeball uh, uh, narrative from that film. Um, about yeah, just not reaching high um, because you'll yeah never be disappointed and you'll just be happy with your art. But uh, <laughs> no, ignore that advice. Right. Um, so we move on to our final album, uh, which is "Smitten" by Pale Waves, and this was picked um, by our guest selector Gemma Cockrell. Uh, she writes for five to nine um some some really great reviews uh also writes for left lion with with carl uh the 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 nottingham based uh magazine i mean you can tell tell us what what the best way to describe the publication <laughs> is yeah uh, not, not based culture magazine covering music arts um you know film literature all that good stuff good stuff so uh yes very much a friend of the the podcast and and uh and, and very much involved with five to nine so uh yeah, great to um, yeah have a as a, our guest selector and uh, yeah we had you know Manchester band Pale Waves. This is their fourth album. Band have heard a fair bit about, not really engaged with. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what did you make of of Smith and Carl? Yeah, so P- P- Pale Waves are an interesting band. Uh, I, I feel that I feel like they seem to get a lot of stick for being unoriginal too similar to other bands and artists you, you know you see them get compared to you know the 1975 because they're on the same label as them you, you know everyone's like they borrow heavily from the cure avril lavigne um which although may be true i think you know you could say that about a lot of other artists saying that they sound like other bands and i think they can sometimes you know that criticism could be yeah, a bit a bit unfair, I would say, um, compared to you know other artists um, that do similar. But I, I think at the end of the day, for me, um, I quite like a lot of their songs. I think they're super catchy, great fun to sing along to at festivals and whatnot. So while they're not a band that I listen to a lot, I've always been happy with you know their existence and listening listening to them on occasion in the right moments as well. Um I think I think in terms of their catalogue, um, I thought the debut was okay. Um it had a song on there called Carl, spelt with a K, same as yours truly. Um, which <laughs> I did a funny post uh around the time it came out, um, which I can't remember the full context of, but basically in the brackets of that song, it's uh Carl and then in brackets, I wonder what it's like to die. Which, <laughs> for a song um, they uh, with the same name as you, I thought was uh, quite amusing. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of fun with that when it came out. And, um, yeah, other than that, there were some great singles on that album. Television Romance, There's a Honey, um, great songs. Um, and then I think their second album, like I say, the debut was okay. Their second album was a big step up. It leaned more into, you know, Naughty's Pop Punk. Again, some great singles on there. Change, She's My Religion, Four to Pieces. Um, and then they continued that on their most, or well, the album before this one, Unwanted, where they sort of stayed more in that rock territory, but they beefed up the guitars a bit, went further down the rock route. Um, again, great singles, Jealousy, Lies, Reasons to Live. And... You know, as a teenager in the noughties, growing up with that style of music, I had, I had fun with those, those records. Very nostalgic, fun throwback to that time. Um, but yeah, on, on this one, on album number four, it seems they've kind of left that style and gone back to their original sound, which is more your Alton dream pop with shades of bands like, you know, we mentioned The Cure, Cocktail Twins, um, I also hear a bit of the cranberries coming through in um, 
you know, Heather's phone calls. And yeah, I, I think ultimately, like their debut, I think it's a it's a decent record that I enjoy on a superficial level. You know, go back to what you said about Jamie XX. I enjoy it more when I don't analyze it too much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's one of those where it's like the songs are catchy. The music has a familiarity and a nostalgia to it. You know, it's not it's not a record that's going to change my opinion of them or storm my year end list or anything like that. But I, it's one of those where it's a, it's a, it's an enjoyable collection of uh, of love songs, um, basically queer love songs. And in terms of the highlights, Glasgow. I think is a great start to the record. Heavy on the Cure vibes, um, which again is no bad thing. Uh, not a love song. Bit of a middle finger to an ex. Again, super catchy. Um, Kiss me again is like this big, you know, fist in the air anthem. Uh, got a real kind of triumphant nature about it. Um, and then the other one that I liked was Slow right at the end of the record. I think that was a nice way to wrap up the album. Um, I will say, obviously, some of the others can be very samey. Um, you know, it does kind of stick to the formula throughout. Um, but again, yeah, there's it's one of those where it, it's just okay. You know, there's nothing here I find offensive on the ears, um, but there's nothing here that really kind of lights, lights me like some of the other uh, albums we've had this month. So... I'll say I'm not quite smitten with smitten. <laughs> I think it's another, you know, decent addition to Pale Waves catalogue without being, for me, their best record or, you know, a game changer, as I say, in any way. But if you're looking for an easy autumnal listen that doesn't require too much investment or commitment, you know, I, I think you could do, you could do worse than this. It, it is a fun record. Yeah, I was thinking about the uh, the streets lyric about once bitten, forever smitten. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've not been bitten uh, either <laughs> either by this record. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you know, broadly similar views views to you in this one, uh, but without the context. Uh, not really a band I've listened to, but but like kind of a, a been aware of their existence and, and kind of yeah, quite intrigued. Um, wanting to listen to so i was quite pleased actually this this was chosen um but subsequently on on you know a few listens um not really blown away um you know you mentioned glasgow i think that's a good good track to begin things probably my two favorites are gravity and thinking about you so the first part of it is is better um but then it just sort of yeah becomes quite samey um and i think actually you know I, I was looking at some of the lyrics on um is it genius.com or something but um you know that there were well not i've not seen it on the on the site before but but heather the the uh the singer she was sort of explaining what all of the songs are about and and i enjoyed that i think more than the songs on, on a lot of occasions <laughs> um i think the you know the, there's this real you know a few of them about not quite being comfortable in in her sexuality when and missing those moments when when others were um mm -hmm. as well and that that and and so there's a real regretful air across a lot of these tracks um you know and I think the the honesty really comes across it's quite poppy in that way so I I, I really appreciate where she's coming from and I think these are important stories to be telling um if a little bit samey in terms of subject yeah. matter i mean a bit like nilifid yanya's you know it's all about relationships it doesn't really move away from that um but but yeah so i think she's you know clearly a, a, a decent lyricist um but i think how how these songs are kind of woven together is yeah could could do with a bit of uh bit of variety and in, 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 in a lot of places a bit more of uh, I think the 1975 was probably the closest reference you know you mentioned them at the top of this one um, and then you know slow I, that, that's probably where I want to leave this with in terms of kind of like what it could have been um, because I feel that like a lot of these sort of 
just end up not grabbing you in any way for you these tracks you know across the album and then you have slow and it's like well hello then you know <laughs> like, yeah. because because uh, actually i felt like heather's uh vocals were just i didn't feel like clearly all of the songs have a lot of meaning behind them but i just didn't get that uh energy in in mm-hmm. the vocals at all and then you come to slow and it's like finally like you know it's that quite uh I don't know, anthemic, um, you know, approach taken. And, and she really sort of, you can hear the passion um, mm-hmm. in, in that one. And and just, you can often have that with albums where like the last song, you know, either points the way to where a band is headed or an artist is headed and then, you know, or it just does something slightly different, which makes you kind of, you know, if she's regretful about all these relationships, I'm regretful that that, that Slow wasn't a bit of a linchpin on which the, the album yeah. was was to be built around really because um because yeah i think if if it had been then i'd have felt a lot more engaged uh as a listen uh but ultimately not really um so i'll I'll take it on on your your good word carl that um they have done better in the past and therefore you know (laughs) should out for when there are returns to form because this doesn't feel like a you know certainly their their best effort um and 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 yeah i think best just to leave that one there (laughs) ultimately so uh yeah we've we've reached the end of our five track five album reviews um and now we come to our verdict so whilst carl and i have spoken an awful lot uh who we haven't heard from of course is the third uh amigo Miley, and in in doing our our reviews, I will let him via the the WhatsApp chat. <laughs> um, whilst we go from his five to one with um, his very quick reviews, <laughs> so Kylie's fifth choice uh, was Pale Waves, and he says bluntly, boring indie rock. <laughs> uh, fourth for Kylie was Nilla for Yanya. So the short review here is not as good as the last, succinct. And, you know, Carl and I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, third, he goes for Hayden Thorpe and Ness. And his short review is epic moments while not holding my attention all the way through. Fair enough. Um, second for Kylie is Jamie XX. And he says... Uh, Features and singles are still the standouts, but overall, a really fun record. And then that leaves Foxing as Kylie's album of the month. And uh, the shortest of all the reviews, don't miss. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, nice to inject a bit, a bit of Kylie back into this one where, unfortunately, he's uh, he is not joining us live, um, but, but next month we hope to have him back. Um, so, yeah, that kicks things off. I mean, Carl, do you want to share your five to one? I can indeed. So at five, I've got Pale Waves. Uh, at four, I've got Nilofe Yanye. And then these next three, I've kind of tossed and turned with a bit because all I'd say all three of these are probably in my top 20 records for the year so far. Again, they were all in my top. The last albums are all in my top uh, 20 for the year. And I think they're going to be right up there again. So while the order could change between now and December, right now I'm going for Foxin, Free, Jamie XX, Two, and Hayden Thorpe at number one. Probably to no surprise. <laughs> yeah, I, I expected that one. <laughs> So um yeah, sorry Pale Waves, it's um it's it's uh fifth for me here and the three points overall. Um then uh, this was the one which I felt conflicted about. It was where I put uh Jamie XX and, and Nilifa Yanya and, and I do have Jamie XX in fourth, um, even though that just doesn't quite feel right, but and, and Nilifa <laughs> Yanya in third. Um, and then it's a the shootout between Foxing and Hayden Thorpe, and this looking at the scores will decide who is our album of the month. So ultimately, um, loved both albums, but um, 
it was foxing for me in second place and and uh by a whisker uh hayden thorpe takes it for his his uh ambitious um yeah voyage on ness and and yeah like i say it works very nicely for us plugging back to the uh the <laughs> podcast you did with him so uh, yeah Massive congratulations to, to Hayden Thorpe for winning our September album of the month. Uh, our lineup for October is Amal and the Sniffers, Japan Droids, Laura Marling, Hayden's uh, former bandmate, who's now uh, one true pairing, and The Smile once more. Uh, also, look out for our poll where we'll be asking you to vote for the fifth album we'll be reviewing in November. And as ever, you can stay up to date with what we're up to by following 5 to 9 on Twitter and Instagram. New Music Central via at New Music Carl on X and Mama Manana Records via at Mama Manana Records on Instagram. Thanks for listening.